You know, a lot of the time we think that the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, which we Southern Baptists have gotten scared to death over, that's another sermon, only deals with the New Testament. Throughout the Old Testament, God tells us that His Spirit is going to minister. He tells us that His Spirit is going to fill His people. God calls us to be filled with His Spirit and to look to Jesus. Our scripture this morning is Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. The burden of the Lord, or the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. In that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with bewilderment and his rider with madness. But I will watch over the house of Judah while I strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. Then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, A strong support for us are the inhabitants of Jerusalem through the Lord of hosts, their God. In that day I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot among pieces of wood and a flaming torch among sheaves. So they will consume on the right hand and on the left all the surrounding peoples while the inhabitants of Jerusalem again dwell on their own sites in Jerusalem. The Lord also will save the tents of Judah first so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem will not be magnified above Judah. And that day the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David, and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. And in that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. And that day there will be great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves the family of the Shimeites by itself and their wives by themselves, all the families that remain, every family by itself and their wives by themselves. Let us pray. Father God, we love you so much and we thank you for the reading of your perfect and infallible word in our midst. And God, we just ask that as we study your perfect and infallible word this morning, that you would illumine our hearts and minds in the same way that you illumined Zechariah's heart and mind when you gave to him this infallible prophecy. God, we love you with all of our heart. We trust you with all of our soul. And we offer to you our love, our lives, and this prayer. In and through the name of our risen Lord and Master, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Throughout the centuries, I mean, listen, beloved, You know, one of the things that they teach you kind of in preacher school is that the component of a sermon, and it's the same thing for those of you that are still having to write papers, the way that you do that is you tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. You know, that's how you do it. And so throughout the Bible, we see that the Old Testament is God telling the people what he's going to tell them. 
and the Gospels is God telling them. And everything past the Gospels is God telling them what He told them. Jesus didn't show up unannounced. This was not a mystery. And throughout the centuries, people have rejected Jesus. I mean, we see during the the time that Jesus walked upon the earth that the people that He came specifically to save turned their back on Him. I mean, honestly, the only way that God could have made it more clear to them is if He had distributed prophetic fulfillment checklist to the leaders of the temple. And that in the field, as Jesus was out uh, about doing His ministry, that they call back to to the temple and say, okay, uh, 14a, He got that one. And that they would have seen that God had been prophesying that Jesus was coming since Genesis 3. And they just turned their back on Him. But it's not all bad news, beloved. There are people that have believed and come to acknowledge Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. There are people that have taken Paul very seriously in what he says in Romans where he says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. Aren't you glad there's a comma there? You know, we have a tendency in our ministries to put a period where God put a comma. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, Zechariah predicted the coming of the Messiah. I mean, we have seen throughout Zechariah's prophecy. And you know, one of the other things they teach you in preacher school is select your text and make a beeline for the cross. Make a beeline for the cross. And some, I mean, i got to be honest with you, there's some text. It's kind of hard. And you get into like Leviticus and Numbers and, and Deuteronomy, it's sometimes hard to make a beeline for the cross. But as we have been going through Zechariah over the last few weeks, we have seen that every chapter had a specific prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ and His ministry. God has promised through Zechariah's prophecy that He is going to deliver Jerusalem and God's people. Now, we understand that this is going to happen in what we call the last days. Because we understand that there's going to be a revival among God's people. We do understand that the Jews are still God's people, right? He he never said in the New Testament, okay, everybody out of the pool, the Jews aren't. What he did, Paul said, is what? He grafted us onto that vine. Okay? He grafted us onto that vine. Now, am I saying that all of the Jews are going to be saved? I'm not saying that at all. There's not a special dispensation for Jews to come uh, into heaven that's different from coming to Jesus. Because listen to me, Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except by me. Jesus didn't say no man except Jews. He said, no man comes to the Father except by me. There is one path and one path only to, to God, and that is through Jesus. And so in the final days, how many of y'all got regrets? You know, I I remember I was a young man when when my mother's younger sister got married. 
And she got married at First Baptist Church, Pocahontas, Arkansas. I remember that because that's where Papa was, was pastoring at the time. It was the biggest church he ever pastored. And my Uncle Wayne had a, about a 65 Mustang, 65 or 66 Mustang. It was almost a crime against humanity to mess that car up for the wedding, okay? To tie the tin cans onto the back of it and to put sardines on the manifold. Don't, don't, don't you know my Uncle Wayne wishes he still had that car right now? I remember my daddy had a 59 Bel Air, black and white. Oh, that was, a, that was a nice car. Wouldn't it be nice if he'd have never traded that car and he'd have given it to me and I could restore it and have this beautiful 59 Bel Air? Okay, now we're talking about things of the world and how we might regret letting go of a, 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 of a vehicle. What Zechariah is talking about in this chapter is that in the last days they're going to look at Jesus and they're going to understand that all along He has been God's plan for the deliverance of humanity and they're going to think about how many of their fellow countrymen never gave their heart to Jesus. The waste. The obstinance. The stubbornness. Zechariah is making it clear that there's going to be a remnant. In fact, there's an entire branch of theology called remnant theology. That if you look throughout the prophets and you look at what the prophets are saying, all of the prophets are talking about a remnant. That God knows that not everyone is going to acknowledge Jesus. Now we know from Peter that it's God's will. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance in, in Jesus Christ. Now listen to me. A lot of people will take that and say, well, it doesn't matter how you live your life. Because God is not willing that any should perish and, and that all should come to repentance. And so God's just going to bring everybody into heaven. That is not what that verse says. It says God is not willing. It's not God's will. God doesn't want people to go to hell. God allows people to choose to go to hell. But God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. It, listen to me. If God wanted the pe people to go to hell, Jesus would never have come. Jesus never would have come. If God's plan all along was to, to see how many people could end up in hell, then Jesus makes no sense. The whole salvation, the verse that we've got up there makes no sense. If God is willing for people to go to hell, the wages of sin is death, but God gave us an out. And the out is faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Zechariah makes it clear that true believers are going to be delivered in that great and terrible day of the Lord. Because God has provided a way for everyone to be cleansed. Verses 1 through 4. Now I want you to see something really important here. The burden, the word burden there is, is a word that, that can be translated oracle. But the burden of the word of Yahweh concerning Israel. Do you understand? Do you understand sometimes, you know, the very, the very first principle of evangelism is that you've got to get a person lost before you can get them saved. See, when, when a young child comes to me and they're talking about being baptized, then we'll begin that Romans road and I'll say, you know, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Can you tell me what sin is? They can always give me a definition of that. Okay. And then you say, have you sinned? And if they answer no, 
then they don't have that burden yet. They don't have that burden yet. And I can't really get them lost in order to bring them the good news. See, it's, a, it's bad news to come to somebody that thinks everything's going along just fine and dandy. And to tell them that their whole world is about to, to collapse out from underneath them. So the burden of the Word of the Lord is to tell people that there is bad, but the, the, the good news is that God has given us an out. Now, Zechariah wants to lay some groundwork here. Thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. What's Zechariah doing here? It is God's right to do this. God made the heavens. God made the earth. God made humanity. All of it is His. He may do as He wishes. What God says goes. And so Zechariah is establishing the authority of God in verse 1. He's also establishing, listen to me, if God stretched out the heavens, if God laid the foundation of the earth, if God, Genesis 2, 7, breathed into, the, into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being, how in the world do you think he's not going to be able to deal with your problem? How in the world do you think he's not going to be able to defend a paltry city? How in the world do you think he's not going to be able to do the things that Zechariah said God is going to do in chapter 12? God, Zechariah is establishing God's authority and he's establishing God's power. Verse 2. God says there's coming a day that everybody's going to be stupefied, that, that I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. You understand, I'm going to use the word here, the, the, the Muslim idolatrous fascination with Jerusalem. Do you understand this is a relatively new development? How many times is Jerusalem mentioned in the Quran? Zero. Jerusalem is never mentioned in the Quran. They claim that it is their third holiest city. During all the centuries that Jerusalem was under absolute Arab control, no Arabic leader ever made Jerusalem the object of a religious pilgrimage. Where did all that come from? Some of y'all are old enough to remember a guy by the name of Yasser Arafat, that peace-loving Palestinian. His uncle, in the 20s and 30s, was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. And he allowed that it would be a good idea to get more Arabs in Jerusalem than Jews because the Jewish population was beginning to grow. And so being a very intelligent man, he decided that he would do what? He would build a religious shrine where? on the site of the old temple and claim that it was now a Muslim holy site so that he could attract Arabic tourists and their money. Seems to me a few centuries ago the Jews tried to do the same thing at the temple and Jesus had something to say about that. That's a whole other sermon. But see, the Muslims will teach that two things happened underneath what we call the Dome of the Rock or the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Number one, that Abraham offered Ishmael 
not Isaac. He offered Ishmael. And then number two, this is where Mohammed supposedly ascended into heaven from. And so if the Muslim fascination with Jerusalem is a mystery, the Jewish claim to the city is entirely scriptural. How many times is Jerusalem mentioned in in Scripture? Over 800 times. I could spend the rest of our time here and, and, and still be going when it was time to dismiss this evening and just be starting to scratch this, the, the topic. And so I'll leave that to y'all to research on your own. Verses 4 through 9. God is going, he's promising that he's going to be the defender of Jerusalem. That he's going to defend the city against the attackers. He plans to destroy every nation that comes against Jerusalem. So what do we learn here? There is no chance of victory for the enemies of God. God's word makes this abundantly clear. Throughout Scripture, we're told of this victory, Matthew 16, 18. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Luke 10, 19, I love this one. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and listen to this next phrase, and over all. All the power of the enemy. Beloved Christian, why do we retreat from the enemy? Jesus said, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Not some of the power, not a little bit of the power. I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you. Romans 8, 35 through 37, Paul said, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Don't you wish he hadn't put that in, in the middle of that? Because, see, if he hadn't put that in the middle of it, then it's just all about, you know, uh, uh, butterflies and unicorns. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Go ahead, put me to death. I'm a conqueror. Go ahead, slaughter me as a sheep. I'm a conqueror. I am a conqueror. There is nothing that you can do to me that will remove me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus my Lord. 1 John 5, 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Now there's a sermon there, beloved. Because you understand the negative of that? If you don't overcome the world, then what's the problem? Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. There's not a mood of possibility. He doesn't say it might, doesn't say it could. He says it does overcome the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Revelation 17, 14. This is talking about what Zechariah is talking about. These will wage war against the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them. Why? Because he is Lord of lords and King of kings and those who are with him are the called and the chosen and the faithful. You understand what that means? Who won the ball game last night? Who won the the Greenville whoever they played last night. We did. Was I out on the court? You don't want to see me out on the court. Last thing you want to see is me in a pair of basketball shorts. Okay? Not a pretty picture. 
I say we because I'm part of that community. Okay? I am part of the community of Jesus, and because he wins, I win. No matter what happens to me, because he wins, I win. Verses 10 through 14. Part of this great outpouring of what is going to defend Jerusalem is an outpouring by God of His Spirit. And as Jerusalem is supernaturally defended and the Spirit is poured out on the nation, they will turn to Jesus. John 12, 32, look at what Jesus said. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Aren't you glad that didn't just refer to the time, the three hours that he was physically on the cross? He said he would draw all men unto himself. And so what Jesus and Zechariah is saying is the same thing that Peter said in his sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, 14 through 36, and we're not going to look at that. But Peter is saying exactly to them that same thing. I want you to look at Jesus, and I want you to understand that He's the fulfillment of what God has been saying to us. He's the fulfillment of what God said through Zechariah. You pierced Him. You killed Him. You put Him to death. And if you compare verses 10 with verses 1 and verses 3, then you see that it makes it clear the me that they're looking upon is the Lord God. It is Yahweh Himself. It is absolute evidence that Jesus, the pierced one, is God and that Yahweh is the triune God. The point here is that the Father sends the Spirit so that we would look upon the Son. And God who will will pour out His Spirit on His people and all who truly believe in Him. And it will result in earnest prayer. That's what Joel said. It will come about after this that I will pour out My Spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out My Spirit in those days. See, beloved, they're going to look upon the Lord Jesus Christ in horror and understand who they crucified. We need an outpouring of God's Spirit to confront us with the horror of our sins, our crimes against the Savior. We all need God's Holy Spirit to bring us to sincere and absolute repentance. Verses 11 through 14. Zechariah is showing us true repentance. He's showing us brokenness. He's showing us that the pattern for coming to Jesus and true repentance is that you look to Jesus and then you mourn over your sin. See, we've got it exactly backwards in our evangelism. We try to get people to mourn over their sin and then get them to look to Jesus. You need to look to Jesus first. Why? Because only when I am looking to Jesus do I see how bad my sin is in God's eyes. If I look to my sin first, then my sin may not be near as bad as yours. And so I I don't come to, to Jesus with a broken heart. I just say, God, I am glad that I'm not like that man over there. Hmm. But when I look to Jesus, I say, Jesus, I am not like you, and I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Have mercy on me, O God. Because I have looked to God first and looked at my sin in light of God's glory. And that breaks me. And once I am broken, I can see by comparison the beauty and the perfection of Jesus. Matthew 26, 75. Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said before a rooster crows, 
you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. 2 Corinthians 7.10, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. I close with an invitation from Scripture, Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon him. Will we return to the Lord, O beloved? Will we look to Jesus? Will we look upon the one whom we pierced and allow him to cause us to weep bitterly and pour out his spirit in our life?